Here we go. Game time. If you don't know who I am, you're about to find out. <clears throat> my name is Ben. Uh, I'm the youth pastor here at Beyond Church. Me and my beautiful wife, Joni, we get to do what we get to do and uh, just love what we get to do with this church. I love this church. I love that God called us here. And uh, you may not know this, but I moved uh, about 800 miles from home to be here. And um, there's no other place on this planet that I call home now. It's this place. And uh, I just believe that it's because uh, just learning at a younger age how to hear God's voice and to follow that and to, to go against what opinions of man might say and learn to lean into what God would say, you'll walk in God's plan for you. And uh, a lot of times we just want God's plan to just unfold automatically, but that ain't how God's plans unfold. They just don't. Typically, it takes me and you putting our hand on some things. And so uh, this morning, what I've got for you guys, uh, I just wanted to talk to you about plans, God's plans. And how many of you guys in here this morning would say, I have heard before somebody say to me at one point or another, God has a plan for you. Raise your hand. I want to see it. So here we are in America, the vast majority of you have heard, God has a plan for you. Well, did you know that when I say that God has a plan for you, that what I'm really saying is God has a promise for you. And when you and I begin to occupy his plan, the way that's going to come about is by me occupying and possessing the promise that he has for me. And so we're not going to sit in church today and hear Pastor Ben talk to me so that I can go and have my El Trio burrito and talk about, well, that was a good message, but I'm not going to do anything with what I just heard. I'm looking at people of action. I'm looking at people that are ready to step out of the seat and go on, be who we are, the label, the jersey on the front, the beyond church. That's who we are. That's the community that I've been called to be. And praise God, we've got opportunity to get out and do something. You know, talking about the Word of God, you know, we see in, in James, sorry, let me open this up so that we can get this rolling this morning, because <clears throat> what I have for you, I believe, is a word of the Lord um, that He's just been talking to me about, and um, I just want to talk to you guys from my heart, and so just starting this out <clears throat> in Second Peter, if you have your Bibles, it's funny that we come to church and we say, if you have your Bible, like, it'd be like going, okay, yeah, I play football. You have your helmet? No. Well, that's part of your equipment. You should probably have that, don't you think? So, um, anyway, okay, I'm not going to step on any too many people's toes. No, I'm just going to step on people's toes this morning. <laughs> you know what? When you come to church, your toes should be stepped on. That's just the truth, because the Word of God is the truth. A lot of times we're living and basing our opinions and whatnot. But the word says this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it starts out, it says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Everybody say everything. everything. You think when God says everything, he means some things or most things or a good portion of things or everything. He thinks everything we need for a living, a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who is, has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us, everybody say, he's given me something. He's given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires, okay? Let's jump over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 20, it says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. So I want to hear you say, all of God's promises are yes and amen. You know, what would happen to us if when we speak God's word, we speak it just like Landon was just talking about? Sometimes we say things that we don't even believe. All of God's promises are yes and amen. That's how we say it, right? Because quite honestly, if we're honest with ourselves, I don't believe that all of God's promises are yes and amen. Well, we need to believe that because that's the truth. And whether, like, God, God can't make you believe something. 
You determine what you believe. And if I sit in here this morning and I tell you, God has a plan for you, but you go, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, okay, Pastor Ben, I know you're in church and you're supposed to tell me that God has a good plan. No, God has created you for a purpose. His purpose, his plan. Everybody say his plan. plan. Say it again, His his plan. That's why you're here. You know, so many people in our world today are asking the question, why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Don't you think if, you ha- if, 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 if I was, uh, I use this example all the time, this is a MacBook Pro, would it benefit me to contact Microsoft and say, how does this MacBook Pro work? No. Why? Because they didn't make it, but God made me. So you know what I should be doing in my life? I should be turning to the one that created me and saying, what did you create me for? Why am I here? And begin to engage a conversation with your Lord, your Father, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He is endeavoring to jump into a conversation with you this morning. And so many times, the length of our conversation with God is a Sunday morning service or a Wednesday night, maybe. And guys, God is saying, hey, I want to talk to you all day, every day. I want you to be functioning in the fullness of the office that I've created you for. Amen? You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter uh, 1, verse 5, he says, God is talking to Jeremiah, and he says, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the fact that there was a day, Dylan, before you were in this green earth, that God came to you and said, hey, come here. And you came in and you stood before the throne room of God. And God said, this is who you are. This is the gifts I've put in you. This is what I want to use you for. This is the place I've called you. These are going to be your brothers. These are going to be your sisters. And he begins to lay out the plans that he has for you. And how many of you in this place today are so much like Jeremiah was, where he goes, that's maybe what you say, but I can't. Have you ever felt like you can't? Raise your hand. Everyone in here at one point or another has said, I can't do what you're asking me to do. But God is the one that created the plan. If I simply do what Apple has created this product to do, it will work. The plan always works. And so how does the plan work? The plan works by the promise. You and I have got to get a hold of a promise. Don't hear it from Pastor Ben. You need to hear it for yourself, that God has a promise for you. Everybody say, God has a promise for me. Whatever situation in life you're in, there's a promise for it. There's a promise to get you out. There's a promise to take you over. There's a promise to heal your body. There's a promise to bring provision. There's a promise to put you in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing and the right people. There's a promise. And guys, the plan is the promise. You want to know what God's plan for you is? You got to know what God's promise to you is. That's the only way that we're going to live in it. That's the only way we're going to walk in it. And so many people are doing the religious thing. We come to church, we sit in a church, we do the church thing because that's what we do in America. We go to church. When is this going to become who I am? That God created me. And God doesn't do things on a hocus pocus level. He does things great, expansive. He does things that would just blow you away. I remember uh, hearing, hearing a message just in the first day that God said, light be. Light was, and in 24 hours, it covered over 19 billion miles of creation. That's the kind of God that we're dealing with with plans here, y'all. He doesn't do things teeny tiny, as Nacho Libre would say. (laughs) Y'all need to laugh, we're in church. (laughs) Okay, so... Something that I had heard in my heart, and this may be for you this morning, just in, in, in sitting in my office, I was, there's a tree right across the road, and a week ago, this whole tree was covered in orange leaves. It's fall time, you know, and um, you guys know, you've probably been taking family photos and all these different things in the orange and the yellows and the reds and just beautiful leaves outside. It's fall time. Well, this tree, um, I was watching as the wind would come through, and, and all of these leaves would begin to just fall off this tree, and, and it had gone from a fully covered tree of leaves, you know, down to where it's like just the bottom portion of it on one side had some leaves on it, and they were kind of falling off here and there. And I heard the Lord just say this in my heart. He said, the leaves are falling. 
the seasons are changing, and he asked me, are you ready for change? And I think that that's a question that you and I need to be asking ourselves on a daily basis, because if you're anything like me, we just kind of fall into our routine, and we do things the way we always do things, and we forget that it takes faith to please God. And if I'm going to live my life by faith, then I better be ready for some change, because he's going to bring me to places that need change, straight up. He's going to bring me to what he created before, which was his plan. Amen? Everybody say his plan. So I'm asking you this morning, are you ready for change? Or are you content with the same problem? Are you content going to sleep every night worrying and fearing for your children? Are you content just going, well, I guess this ailment is just who I am. It's a part of who I am and it's just how I'll always be. Are you content with going, well... You know, financially, we've never been able to get ahead, so that's just, that's the story of our lives, and we'll just, we're going to live this way. We're, we're never going to get ahead. I think we need to be willing to say, you know what, if there's things that aren't right in my life, then I need to get with my creator and find out, what's the promise? What's the promise for me? Because I don't want to occupy death. I want to occupy life. Amen? And so, um, just starting this morning, I'm gonna, we're going to play just a, a little quick game. I'm going to give you some words, and I want you to tell me what these words, what the picture that you get when I say these words. Uh, rubber, metal, carpet, light bulbs, leather. They're already saying it. Car. All right? Anybody think of a car when I'm saying these things? Carpet, leather, headlights. Um, you know, all of us are kind of thinking about a car, right? All right, let's check out this one. Uh, tall, yellow, patterned, long neck. Africa. <laughs> I, 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 I wish you could come up here and sit on the stage and see what I see. <laughs> because that's what y'all look like. <laughs> so what, what do you think that was? Big bird. Not big bird. A giraffe, okay? So think about this. This this is a different one. This one might take a little bit more thinking, and if you know it, please keep your mouth quiet. <laughs> Explore, direction, path, guide, search, scout. Dora. Dora, <laughs> Dora the Explorer. <laughs> That's the message, guys. I came to tell you that you are the Doras. Okay, no. <laughs> Anybody? Huh? The Bible. That's awesome. In fact, that's what I was just going to say is all those words are words that you find in this book. So that's interesting to me because what that says to me is God wants to take me somewhere. God wants to take me on a journey. God wants to take you on a journey. How many of you guys know that living life in this world isn't always like this? <laughs> I'm walking on sunshine. Whoa, nothing ever goes wrong, oh, right, right, am I right, sometimes life is like, this is horrible, why am I here, why do we got to have so many problems, what the heck, I'm a Christian, I should have no problems, right, God, God, this is how we approach him. God! <laughs> da! Right? Is that what we do? If we're honest, that's what we do. And it's okay that we do that if we approach him and say, you're not the one that's wrong here, God. My life is a picture of my decisions. I know you have good plans for me, but if I'm not walking in your good plans, that's not your fault. That's mine. And I think we need to be able to be like that with God, a little bit more vulnerable to say, you know what? The reason that my life is horrible right now is not because God. It's because of me. And so, you know, just thinking about this, that God has a journey how many of you guys know that when you go on a journey, everything's not always peachy keen and perfect and wonderful and amazing and, 
And sometimes, you know, you go on a family vacation and even as much as you're so looking forward to being on the beach, you go there with your kids and, and you can't find quiet time and, and it's noisy and Johnny wants to steal Sally's this and kids spill in the car and, uh, you know, just whatever it is, you and your spouse get into a fight or whatever. Everywhere we go in life, you're going to run into roadblocks, problems, issues. Why? Just look at your neighbor. Just look at him. <laughs> Because that's why we're people. And you know what? We're people. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a children's server, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a coach, whether you're a factory worker, a guy that works on cars, whoever you are, you are a person and you deal with people. And so I'm thinking, you know, as the Lord is talking to me about this, I just heard him say in my heart, if you want to write this down for what this message is called, it's called, the plan is the promise. The plan is the promise. You want to know if this is God's plan? Compare it to promise. If you're going, man, I'm sick, it must just be God's plan. Okay, well, let's go and find a promise in the word where God says, I promise to make you sick. I promise to do this to you. I, I promise to destroy this and destroy that in your life. You won't find those kind of things. Are you out here this morning? So the plan is the promise. Real change always starts with a plan. Benjamin Franklin said, failing to plan is planning to fail. You can bet your bottom dollar if you don't have a plan then you definitely don't have God's promise for you. Um, do you have that picture that I had given earlier? Put that up there. I want to just kind of show you guys. This is on our wall at home. So these are just things that we're believing God for. And none of, none of that is just, oh, just whatever we can, let's just, pull up the lottery and hopefully, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. Like, we took time to hear what is God saying. And these are just some of the things that we have written on, on our stuff. We're believing for a house. We're believe, we, we were believing for an anniversary trip. I can tell you a quick little story. We were going to Florida, and I had $200 that I was going to take to Florida with me. And, and, and the day that before we were leaving was a Sunday, and I heard the Lord say, I want you to give that. And I'm like... <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want to give it. And I remember being at the bank, holding onto that money and having this internal, no, I don't want to. And I could just, it was like he had his arm around me almost like, are you going to do it or not? And I said, Lord, you know that I don't want to do this, but I know that this is what you're asking me to do. And so, yes, I'm going to do it. And I remember coming to church and giving that, that $200 that day. <clears throat> and by 5 o'clock that evening, just in random gifts, we had been given 700 God's good. His plan is awesome. And if you'll get in tune with his plan listening for his promise, you'll have exactly what you want in life. Amen? So these are, like, just as a, as a picture for y'all, you know, going home, maybe you're dealing with an ailment, maybe you're dealing with you want to have a child, maybe you want a home, or whatever it is for you. Take time to get with the one who created you and go, God, what does the plan look like? And he'll begin to give you a picture of what you can expect in the plan. Amen? And uh, I just believe, like, this is for us. We see these things, and we, we read these things. And you can see in that picture on the bottom that my boy drew last night, that little ornament thing, I got a really long neck. <laughs> and Joni's as tall as me, but you know what? I love it. Thank you, God. So we just have a whole bunch of different things up there. And that's not so much, you know, for you to, you know, copy what I have. I want you to get with the Lord. And, and this is just a reminder to me even that, Hey, you see this in your house, and there's many times that you see it, but you don't even look at it, really, yeah. you know? You don't take any time to go, yeah, that's God's promise to me. I've got scripture for everything up there that he said to me concerning what my future looks like. But 
Just because I have that doesn't mean that's what I'm going to be walking in if I don't possess that. Amen? And so God has called you and I to possess what he is asking us to explore. Explore. Amen? So I've got these binoculars up here. You can go ahead and take that down. I've got these binoculars up here. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hunter. So um, if I asked any one of you to come up here and use these, Every single one of you would use them, I believe, the right way. You'd look, use them, look through them this way, right? Like put your eyes on the small end and look through them. And you can read, you know, that sign back there says core values. We are the church. The church is not a pastor. It's a body. We know we are equipped to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, if I take this tool and I turn it around and go this way with it, holy moly. I can't even, I mean, I can see that there's a small, small square in there but I can't read it. And I think a lot of times when we hear that God has a plan for you, that this is kind of how we explore God's plan is we take the tools and we think, man, it's so far away, God. I don't even know how I could attain that. And he's going, you're not looking at it right. You need to look through it from my perspective. And when you do that, oh, okay. So now what I couldn't see becomes a whole lot clearer. And I think that that's what we need to do with the Lord. When he says, explore my promises, really look into them. Look them. Look into them and look them over. And find what you need to find. Don't just find what Pastor Ben said or what Pastor Nate said or so-and-so on TV or whatever. Find, God, what are you saying to me? Because what he says to me, that's his promise to me. And he'll always back up his plan with his word. Promise. And so if you're looking, if you're wondering what's God's plan for my life, just begin to look into God's word. Guys, this whole book is full of promises. Unfortunately, in our world today, this is the most overlooked book, I believe, in in so many homes. You know, we got kids that are excited about things like Harry Potter and just weird stuff. While the most powerful book in the world sits on our shelves and collects dust. But God says, I created you for a plan, and the plan is the promise. So there's three things that we got to know in order to function in his plan. Number one is this, that God planned for me before I was born. So Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, the Lord gave me this message that I knew you you before you were in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. And this is what we do so many times when we begin to see what God has planned for us. We begin to, we begin to reason and think within ourselves all the reasons why something can't be done. Why God can't use me. I'm unqualified. I'm not good enough. I'm not tall enough. I don't have a good enough voice. I, 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 you know, I'm this, I'm that. And we, be, we have this horrible picture of ourselves. And God's going, you're my prized creation. You're the one that I want to use. I created you for this purpose. And so he says, I knew you before. And like I was saying, there was a moment in time in, in, you know, before any of us were here that God had a one-on-one meeting with you and he put within you exactly what he wanted in planet earth in 2019. And so, you know, have you ever heard somebody say things like, um, man, I wish I was born 70 years ago, like, or whatever, you know, like the, like, I I think about, I've got uh, somebody that I know and and they, they talk about, man, I just wish I was alive in this era when these cars were coming out, you know, and uh, just a a, a car guy, you know, And, and I think, you know, we have our plans, but our plans are, are quite honestly pathetic compared to his. He knows what, we, what the world needed in 2019, and that's why he put you here. Amen? And so number one is that God planned for me before I was born. Um, in, in number two, I'm just going to go to number two. It says, uh, his plan for me, you need to know this, that his plan is good. And everywhere you hear plan, think promise. Um, his plan for me is good. His promise for me is good. Run over to, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of backstory with this. In Jeremiah chapter 29, we've all, if I, if I, we're sitting in church tonight or this morning, and you guys know, if I say Jeremiah 29, every one of you is thinking what? 
11. Every single one. Yeah, I've heard that. And this is what we do in church. I've heard that. I've heard that. Well, then you need to hear it again because Bible says faith comes by hearing. Faith is coming by hearing. And some of us need to hear it again, that God has a good plan for you, a plan that produces a future that you would hope for. You think God knows what you would hope for? I think he does. I think he's a little bit bigger than the six inches between your ears. Amen? So you're thinking Jeremiah 29, 11. This is interesting to me because the, the beginning of this chapter in, in my Bible, it says this is a letter to the exiles. This goes on. It starts out in verse Four, it says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. So you guys probably don't know a whole lot of the backstory, but basically the children of God, the people of God, Israel, got taken captive. And, and all this crazy stuff is going on, but God says, listen, they may have taken you captive, but I'm still with you. And he says in verse 5, build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens. Sorry. Um, plan to stay. Plant gardens. Eat the food they produce. Marry. Have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. This is what we do so many times when, 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 when it seems like the world's going the way we, sh- we don't want it to go. God says, just be where you're at and flourish. I'm with you. Even though it's a hard place, I haven't left you. I'm still with you. Still have children. Still be married. Still build a home. Still flourish in life. God, you, you, I didn't, you weren't brought out here to just famish and die. And so we're in a hard place. Golly, that was like a loogie right there. I don't even, holy smokes. We feel like we're in a hard place. But God says, just because you're in a hard place doesn't mean it has to be hard. Just be married. Be, be in tune, be involved, have children, eat good food, all this different stuff. He says, and work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for its welfare will determine your welfare. And this is what the Lord of heaven's army, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they're not telling you or because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things that I have promised. Interesting. He uses those words promised. He does what he promises. And I will bring you home again. So it goes on to say, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. And they are not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you, and I will bring you home again to your own land. So even though you may be in a hard place, know this, that God's plan for you is good. You need to know that. That's what's going to keep you in the hard place. Amen? We need a foundation when we're in those hard places and things are bumping and pushing and wanting to pull and cause us to to fall off and get angry at God and like we do with him. He says, hey, I'm with you. I'll cause you to flourish. Even though you're not where you want to be, I'll, I'll be with you and I'll cause you to flourish and I will bring you back into the land that I swore to give you. Amen? So number one, God planned for me before I was born. Number two, his plan for me is good. And number three, he is with me all the way. Hebrew 13, uh, Hebrews 13, five says that I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. That's a promise. Guys, if God says that, he's not like, oh, you know what would sound really good right here in the Bible is if I just said that I'll be with him. And, and uh, uh, let's, oh, and interject in there that, that I'll never abandon him either. No, if he says it, it's a promise. And if it's his promise, then it's his plan, it's his plan for me, amen? And so uh, we're gonna jump into this, Numbers chapter 13. And I'm gonna just kind of show you a picture going back to um, what we had talked about in the beginning with these different words. Um, explore, direction, path, guide, search, scout. I believe that God wants to take us on a journey and, and, and much like the, 
me and uh, my brother-in-law Juan were talking at the beginning of, the, uh, of this last service, and, and um, we we're just talking about, oh yeah, the children of Israel. And, and you know what's funny? When I read the children of Israel, I think that's me. Man, I'm just like these people. Whether I like it or not, golly, I complain a lot. I pout. I tell God how it can't be done, and you know whatever. <clears throat> And so here's the children of Israel. The Bible says in chapter 13 of Numbers that the Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan. Now, I need you guys to see this, that that's not all he said. But that's, I think, kind of all they heard. They didn't hear the promise that was attached to the direction here. Because what they heard was, go explore the land. Now, I believe that two people heard what he said. What he said was, go explore the land that I am giving them. But two, or, or, uh, the 10 out of the, out of the 12 heard, go explore the land. Now, how do we do this with God? Some, we do this with God way too many times. When we're exploring, first of all, we're exploring from this parameter. Where we're going, all these promises, God, they're way too far away. I don't know how I can ever occupy that. I don't know how I could ever have that in my life. I've had nothing but heartache, nothing but problems. Every guy I get with is a screw up, you know, just whatever. And you have all your reasons why it can't be done. And what are we doing? We're exploring, but we're not exploring accurately. And so you see in this story that it goes on into into, uh, verse 17. It says, Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north. And uh, verse 18, he says, see what the land is like. Yeah, what, what, is, what is the promise of God to you like? What is that like? Now listen to this. This is how men think. Is it good or bad? Is it easy or hard? Is it fruitful or unfruitful? Well, I don't know. If God said that it's mine, what do you think it is? I think it's probably going to be fruitful. I'm thinking it's probably going to be pretty dadgum good. I'm thinking, you know what? This isn't like the, the, the you know, uh, I don't, I'm, like the lost land of Atlantis or whatever. You know, this is, this is a piece of property that people are already living in. They've already developed it. It's got all the city walls. It's got everything that you need to have a full functioning, glorious land there. Business is rolling. It's not like they're just getting out there and it's all crickets and they're like, oh, wow, this, uh, this is interesting. We found a piece of property here in the middle of nowhere that I guess nobody knew about and we just get to walk in and occupy it. God's plans typically don't look like that. Typically, they look like, uh, you actually got to go in there and get it away from them. <laughs> what, God? I've got a, what? You want me to occupy? So listen to this. <clears throat> he says, see what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak. Few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do the towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil uh, fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back some samples of the crops. You know the story. You know the size of the grapes they came back with? Like, okay. As a full-grown man, I can probably carry, you know, if if I put 100 pounds on my back, I could probably carry that, right? These grapes were so big that it took two men to carry them. Now, we're talking about some serious grapes. (laughs) These are man grapes, okay? Like, and I believe that God was just giving them a little picture of just what you can expect. This is what you can expect walking in my plan. So it goes on, and it says, uh, so they went up, and then they explored the land um, from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near Lebo Hamath, uh, going north, they passed through the Negev and arrived to Hebron, uh, where a he-man, Shishai, and Tal- Tal- Talmai, all descendants of Anak, lived. Okay, now this is, where, this is where it gets interesting to me. So, there was three names there, the descendants of Anak. <clears throat> now, I want to just ask you, like, just thinking in normal human being, 
I've got an army of 650,000 men right now, ready to rock. Now, if I come to you, I send out my battalion to go to war, whatever, and my guy comes back and he goes, hey, we've, we've scouted out the land. We've got 650,000 of us. There's three of them. There's three people. We can't go. We can't go in. There's three. Three. Are you hearing me? There's three. Now, any one of you in here today is going, ah, yeah, that's stupid. There's 650,000 of you. Get your butts in there and go get it. But this is what the enemy does. He causes you to reason. And just like King David versus Goliath, the little teenage boy, one giant, the whole army, but the giant is laying out the terms. And the people of God, instead of listening to the promise of God, are going, we can't have what God said we can have because you're big. You're too big, too strong. Well, let me ask you, could they possess the land? Could they possess it? Can you possess it? Can you possess the promise that God has for you? Yes. But you know what we do? We look at the obstacles. And we go, they're too big. They're too hard. I've waited too long. God's not going to come through. I want you to check, uh, check up on your obstacles. Are they obstacles or are they opportunities? I think they're opportunities. What I find is that when you follow God, what looks like an obstacle to man is actually an opportunity for God. So, you guys know the story? We're like grasshoppers. Really? I think that the giants would have probably went running the other way if you heard the footsteps of 650,000 men with their swords. We're coming to war. We're coming to take your land. We're coming. But you know what? They didn't have the promise. All they heard was explore. Are you looking to explore God's promise to you? To just explore it? Because that'd be a good idea. Or are you looking to explore it to possess it? Because when God gives you a promise, he expects you to possess it. Possess the promise. This is mine. And it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what I feel like. It doesn't matter what my circumstance says. When faith comes, it's established. This is mine, and I can have it. Amen? You guys following me today? <clears throat> God's not interested in me just exploring his plans. He wants me possessing them. Amen? God's plan for me is his promise to me. You want to know what God's plans look like in your life? Just begin to find out what his promise looks like, because the Bible is plumb full of them. <clears throat> so at this point, um, well, let me just ask you this. You got, you got all these people, the 12 came back, and out of the 12, 10 of them came back with the wrong report. Can you imagine God telling you to do something and you coming back to God and standing before him and going, can't be done. You don't know what you're talking about, God. It can't be done. The people are this. The walls are too big, all these obstacles, all these problems, it can't be done. I believe that God would just look at you and just look at you because he's expecting you to get it done. And you know what? Two, two people. So let's just figure out what's that, like 85%, I guess, said it can't be done. Sounds like a, lot, a bunch of people in our world today. You can't do what God's called you to do. You can't be who God's called you to be. You can't be, you, can't be, you can't be healed from that disease. You can't be financially set. You can't give $100,000. All the different things that we say we can't do, doesn't matter what people say, what God say. He's the one that's to have the final say in our lives. And you and I, whether we believe it or not, we've been called stewards something. 
Every person in here, you've been giving some, given something. Whether big or small, God expects you to steward it. And we don't like this kind of talk. We like, everything's going to be all right. But God's a, a businessman, number one. And he's, he knows all the details of everything. He knows exactly what he's put on the inside of every single one of you. And he expects you and I to steward it and to steward it well. Amen? So I wrote down in my notes uh, today, just talking about the plan as the promise. So what are some of his promises that you and I need to get a hold of? And I just wrote down a few different things that I was thinking about as I was uh, writing this morning. God's promised us healing. If you're sick in here today, you don't have to be. And I'm not just talking about sick as in, oh, you know, I got a, a stomach ache or a, a, a bug or whatever. I'm talking about you're sick in your mind. I'm talking about you lay up at bed at night thinking about whatever it is that you think about. Pornography or just how you want to hurt somebody or just whatever. Demented stuff. If you're sick, it's not God's plan for you. Definitely not his promise to you. Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, if this is you, if you're sick, if you're needing healing of any sort, the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Let me tell you, what Jesus did on the cross was enough. It says that by his stripes, you were, were healed. That's 1 Peter 2, 24. In Psalms 107, verse 20, the Bible says that they cried out to him for help, and he sent in his word, and he healed them, and he delivered them from death. That's the business that he's in delivering people. You know, I think, what, what would happen? What would happen in, in me? What would happen in our church? What would happen in our community if, as people, we got a little bit more real with God? And we went to God and said, you know what? I am sick. And we went to God and we said, you know what, God? I, I carry myself and I, I, I got the smile and I got the look and I got what seems like everything is together on the outside, but internally, I'm about had it with this life. What would happen? Because the Bible says that if you call out to him for help, he'll send in reinforcements, his word, his promise to heal you and deliver you from death. It's not his plan that anybody in here would have perish in their life. Provision, maybe you need provision. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19. Now, these are all promises that are found in the word of God. Philippians 4, 19 says that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So maybe you're sitting in here today and you say, yeah, I've tried that, but that doesn't work. It works. It always works. God's faithful. I can tell you just in my own life, I have seen so many times, so, so, so many times, God is good and he comes through and when I'm knocking my head on the wall just going oh my gosh does any of this work ding dong yep it works <laughs> God's faithful you wouldn't know that you won't know those kind of stories until you begin to grab a hold of a promise and find out how much the enemy really doesn't want you having what he promised you. You can't have victory without a fight. Amen? Uh, so provision. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.18 says that you have given me the power to obtain wealth, that you may establish a covenant which you swore to my fathers as it is this day. You know, God wants his people well off. He wants you blessed, favored, increasing on every front. Not just in the dollar either. Having provision in your family. Good, strong relationships. All that good stuff. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Like, again, if you're taking notes, like these are just simple promises. These are things that you can write down and put on your wall at home and speak them and declare them and believe them and get them in you so that when the enemy comes to try and push you off what God said you can have, you don't get pushed off. I'm having the promise. So, 
uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 talks all about giving, sowing, and reaping, and, and, and just how uh, if, if you want to reap much, you got to sow much. And that doesn't always just look like money, you know. Your time is valuable. Every one of you have been given the same amount of time in a day. What's your time look like? How is it being spent? How is it being invested? Uh, fertility, maybe you're in here today and you, you're just, you want to have a kid. You and your, your spouse are just, you've been wanting to have children. That's a promise. And God wants to get that promise in your life, amen? amen. Will we contend for those things? It's all, that's Psalms 113 verse 9 and Psalms 127 verse 3. And there's more of them in there. I just wrote down a few, you know, uh, the cares, you know. I, I, believe, I believe especially in our world today that this is, a, this is a big kicker to a lot of people. We have, a, for lack of a better term, poop ton of cares, And we come to church and we put on our church face and we're covered in care. And God, Jesus would say to you, come to me. All of you who are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. That's a promise. But just because he said it doesn't mean that, that, that that's what I have. I gotta possess that promise. I gotta make that mine, amen? Amen. Numbers chapter 13 could have looked a whole lot different. It changed the outcome for millions of people. The bad report. Millions of people suffered because 10 people that were in leadership roles carried poison. And instead of saying what God said, they reasoned. And they said, this is what we're capable of doing. When in all reality, if they would have really taken what God had said and explored it correctly, they would have been off in a distance and they would have been looking through those glasses. And they would have seen signs on that property that had their name on it. And they would have realized that, you know what? Somebody else is living in my land. Now let me ask you, you go home today. <laughs> I believe that this is the Lord. You go home today. All your stuff is out of your house and somebody else is in there with all their stuff. What would you do? Well, I guess this is their house now. Darn. Wish I would have known they were coming. Because God told them that's your land. That's yours. You and I would be fighting tooth and nail. Get out of my house. This is my house. I pay for this place. I sleep on my couch here. You can take all your stuff. Get it out. Right? I think that's how we need to be with the plans and the promises of God. Instead of the enemy occupying that place in our lives, nope, this is my house. This is my land. Out. <laughs> Amen? Whew. So today, as we're closing this up, the very last of our two-service format, here's what we're going to do. This is only going to get better, guys. It's only going to get better. We've allotted time for altar to just, for you and I to come into his presence. Because you know what we need, really? It's not more money. It's not more time. It's not a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a new car or a bigger house or all the things that we think we need, what we really need, we just need to come. Sit with him. Give him something to work with. You guys know the story with the, the man and the, or the, the feeding of the 5,000. You know, I remember reading that one day. You think about 
the bread and the fish. I remember hearing the Lord just say this so loud internally. He just said, I could have done it with a breadcrumb and a fish scale. He could have fed all them people with just a crumb. The thing is, are you willing to take your crumb and put it in his hand? We've got a moment here that might challenge your ordinary. You might have to get out of the seat that you're so comfortable in every week and find yourself at his feet, pouring out your heart, allowing him to do what only he can do with your situation. He can heal you. He can deliver you. He can fill you up with peace. He can give you joy. He can satisfy your life. He can do it all. The thing is, will I possess that? I don't want you to sit in church today and just know that. I want you to possess it. Amen.